أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إذ تستغيثون ربكم فاستجاب لكم أني ممدكم بألف من الملائكة مردفين وما جعله الله إلا بشرى ولتطمئن به قلوبكم وما النصر إلا من عند الله إن الله عزيز حكيم إذ يغشيكم النعاس أمنة منه وينزل عليكم من السماء ماء ليطهركم به وينزل عليكم من السماء ماء ليطهركم به ويذهب عنكم رجس الشيطان ويربط على قلوبكم ويثبت به الأقدام إذ يوحي ربك إلى الملائكة أني معكم فثبت الذين آمنوا سألقي في قلوب الذين كفروا الرعب فاضربوا فوق الأعناق واضربوا منهم كل بنان ذلك بأنهم شاقوا الله ورسوله وَمَنْ يُشَاقِقِ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ شَدِيدُ الْعِقَابِ ذَلِكُمْ فَذُوقُوهُ وَأَنَّ لِلْكَافِرِينَ عَذَابَ النَّارُ يا أيها الذين آمنوا إذا لقيتم الذين كفروا زحفا فلا تولوهم الأدبار وَمَنْ يُوَلِّهِمْ يَوْمَئِذٍ دُبُرَهُ إِلَّا مُتَحَرِّفًا لِقِتَالٍ أَوْ مُتَحَيِّزًا إِلَى فِئَةٍ فَقَدَ بَاءَ بِغَضَبٍ فقد باء بغضب من الله ومأواه جهنم وبئس المصير صدق الله العظيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين إن شاء الله we will read the narrative of the battle of Badr Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the translation of which is permission to fight back is hereby granted to those being fought for they have been wronged and Allah is truly most capable of helping them prevail they are those who have been expelled from their homes for no reason other than proclaiming, Our Lord is Allah. Had Allah not repelled the aggression of some people by means of others, destruction would have surely claimed monasteries, churches, synagogues, and mosques in which Allah's name is often mentioned. Allah will certainly help those who stand up for Him. Allah is truly all-powerful, almighty. For over 13 years, Muslims had not been allowed to fight back against the brutality of the Meccan pagans, leading to the migration of the Prophet ﷺ and many of his companions. As the hostilities continued, these verses were revealed, allowing Muslims to fight back. When the Muhajirun migrated to Medina, they left behind their homes and valuables, which were taken by the pagans of Mecca. To redress this financial loss, the Prophet ﷺ decided to capture an unarmed Meccan trade caravan headed by Abu Sufyan, a Meccan chief. Eventually, the caravan escaped, but the Meccans mobilized an army of over 1,000 well-armed soldiers, more than three times the size of the Muslim force, which consisted of 313 soldiers. This led to the great battle of Badr, which took place on the 17th of Ramadan in the second year after the Hijrah. Preparing for war. 
The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam consulted the companions after the caravan had gone and the army was coming out to meet them. Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu spoke excellently, followed by Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu, who also spoke excellently. Miqdad radiallahu anhu then said, O Messenger of Allah, by Allah, we will not say to you what the tribes of Israel said to Musa. Go, you and your Lord, and fight. We are staying right here. Rather, we say, go, you and your Lord, and fight. We will fight with you. By Allah, we will certainly fight in front of you, behind you, and to your right and left. This made the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam very happy, and his face lit up. But he asked the group once again, give me your counsel. The migrants' willingness to fight was beyond question. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wanted to gauge the helper's willingness, the Ansar, since their agreement had been only to defend Medina, not to go out in battle. At that moment, Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh radiallahu anhu, who was true, sincere, and preferred Allah and his messenger over all else, understood what the Prophet ﷺ was asking. He said, O Messenger of Allah, it is as if you are directing your question to us, the Ansar. He then delivered a speech that was filled with meaning. O Messenger of Allah, we believe in and affirm that what you have come with is true. We have taken oaths and given you our pledge on that basis. Therefore, go wherever Allah has commanded you. There are people who stayed behind in Medina who would not have stayed behind, who have just as much love for you as we do. Had they known that you were to engage in battle, they would not have stayed behind. Perhaps you wanted something, yet Allah willed something else. Go wherever you want, for by Allah, if you were to take us until we reached Birk al Ghimad in Abyssinia, we would go with you and not one man would stay behind. If you took us to the sea and plunged in, we would dive in with you. We have no fear of meeting the enemy. We are steadfast in war and unwavering in battle. The Prophet's face, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, lit up like the moon. And he said, continue onwards and receive good news that brings you joy. Allah has truly promised me victory over one of the two groups, either the caravan or the army. By Allah, it is as if I am now looking at the places of the enemy's fatalities. The Muslims entered the valley of Badr from the southern pass and paused to rest. It was a flat plain covered with soft yellow sand, which made walking difficult, and there was no water. They were tired, and they lay down to rest. Soon Allah sent down some rain which provided them with water and made the ground firmer under their feet. They then pushed forward to the well nearest to them and stopped there. One of the companions, Al-Hubab ibn al-Mundir radiallahu anhu, having had prior experience of the valley, wished to advise the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but being wary lest he should break the rules of courtesy with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he first asked, Has Allah inspired you to choose this spot, or is it a matter of planning and stratagems of war? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam immediately replied, it is a matter of planning and stratagems of war. Reassured, Al-Hubab said, In that case, this is not a good place. Let us go and make camp at the farthest well. Build a basin and fill it with water. Then fill up all the other wells so that the enemy will be deprived of water. The Prophet wasallam approved of this plan and they moved to the new camp which was on a hill in the middle of the valley. Once there, they built a hut for the Prophet ﷺ to be his headquarters. The basin was made and filled with water, and the other wells in the valley were filled up with sand and rocks. As the Prophet ﷺ formed the army, he passed in front of each man to lift their spirits 
and to straighten their ranks, bearing an arrow in his hand. Stand in line, O Sawad, he said to one of the helpers, who was too far forward. And he gave him a slight prick in his belly with the arrow. O Messenger of Allah, you have hurt me, said Sawad. Allah sent you with truth and justice, so give me my retribution. Take it, said the Prophet wasallam, laying bare his blessed midsection and handing him the arrow. Whereupon Sawad stooped and imprinted a kiss where it was his due to place the point of the arrow. What made you do that? said the Prophet wasallam, And he answered, O Messenger of Allah, we are now faced with what you see, and I desired that at my last moment with you, if so it be, for my skin to touch your skin. The Prophet wasallam prayed for him and blessed him. The battle begins. Quraysh had now begun to advance. Seen across the undulating dunes, the Meccan army appeared to be much smaller than it was. When hearing of the Meccan leaders present in the polytheists' army, such as Abu Jahl, Umayyah ibn Khalaf, Utbah, and others, the Prophet wasallam said, Here is Mecca. She has thrown out to you her most beloved sons. When the two armies faced each other in battle, three men from the pagan side stepped forward, each challenging the Muslims to a duel. The men were among the leaders of Quraysh, and had been incensed by Abu Jahl, accusing them of cowardice when they had tried to convince their people not to fight. They were Utbah and Shayba, sons of Rabi'ah, and Utbah's son, Al-Walid. Before the Prophet ﷺ could give any orders, three young helpers sprung forward, eager to demonstrate their devotion to their cause. But the Prophet ﷺ ordered them back and told his own cousins, Ubaida ibn al-Harith, Hamza, and Ali radiyallahu anhum to respond to the challenge. They had exchanged but a few blows before Sayyidina Hamza killed Shayba. Sayyidina Ali killed al-Walid. Although Sayyidina Ubaida and Utba had wounded each other seriously. At that point, Hamza and Ali radiyallahu anhuma immediately turned upon Utba, finished him off, and carried Ubaida back to where the Prophet ﷺ was standing. As it became clear that the wound was fatal, Sayyidina Ubaidah anhu asked the Prophet ﷺ if he would be considered a martyr in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet ﷺ gave his beloved cousin the good news that he was. Angered by the death of their champions, the pagans charged the Muslims whom the Prophet ﷺ had arranged in a square formation and instructed to withhold their arrows until the enemy was very close to make sure that each arrow would count. As the assault continued, the Muslims were hard pressed and suffering losses. The Prophet ﷺ prayed to his Lord, O oh Allah, should this group be defeated today, you will no longer be worshipped on earth. He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam continued to supplicate intensely for the help which Allah had promised him. The valor of the companions, radiallahu anhum. Some of those present at Badr were at the early stage of their youth, around 15 years old. We find the likes of the two youths who were young in age, yet great in lo the loftiness of their aspirations, who were standing by Abdurrahman ibn, ibn Awf radiallahu anhu in battle. Mu'adh and Mu'awwidh, the sons of Afra, radiallahu anhuma. Abdurrahman said, When the army formed ranks for battle, I saw a young boy to my right and another young boy to my left, which made me feel unsafe. I then sensed the person to my right calling me and whispering, Uncle, do you know which one is Abu Jahl? I said, Yes. He said, I request that you point him out to me if we see him during battle. I said, my nephew, what do you want with him? He replied, I was told that he used to harm Allah's messenger. I swear by the one who reigns over my soul that if I see him, I will not stop assaulting him until one of us is dead. 
I was amazed by his faith and strong resolve. Then the other young boy spoke to me, asked me the same question, and gave me the same answer. I would not have preferred two large and powerful men in their stead. During the battle, Abdurrahman ibn Auf radiallahu anhu saw Abu Jahl. So he said to the two of them, there he is. They swarmed him and slew him. Abdurrahman ibn Auf said, describing them, they were like two falcons swooping upon their prey. They struck him until he fell, after which they went to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam to give him the good news of the demise of the tyrant who stood in the way of truth. The Prophet asked them, which of you two killed him? Each of them claimed that he was the one who had killed him. Then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam asked, did you clean your swords? They said no. After looking at their swords and seeing blood on both, he said sallallahu alayhi wasallam, you both killed him. Another companion present at the battle was a young man who was 17 or 18 years old, the martyr of exalted rank, Sayyiduna Haritha radiallahu anhu. He was his mother's only child. He exemplifies the lofty and sublime aspirations found within the hearts of the people of purity and nobility. Prior to the battle, he asked the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant him martyrdom. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam then said, O oh Allah, grant Haritha martyrdom in your cause. Haritha was one of the 14 who were martyred. When the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam returned to Medina, Haritha's mother came to him and asked, O oh Messenger of Allah, you know how precious Haritha was to me, and I have no other child except him. Where is my son, Haritha? He replied, Consider him with Allah. He was killed in the cause of Allah. She requested again, Tell me where my son is. The Prophet responded, I am telling you that he was killed in the cause of Allah, so consider him with Allah. Finally, she said, I am asking you where my son is. If he is in the garden, then I will be patient. If it is otherwise, then what shall I do? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam replied, Mercy on you, O mother of Haritha. Paradise does not have just one garden, but many gardens, and your son has attained the highest firdos. The turning of the tide. After the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had intensely called upon Allah with his names, Ya Hayyu, Ya Qayyum, O oh, living and self-subsistent, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then revealed, when you cried out to your Lord for help, he answered, I will reinforce you with a thousand angels followed by many others. A light slumber came upon him, and when he awoke, he said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, be of good cheer, Abu Bakr, Allah's help has come. Here is Jibreel, and in his hand is the rein of a horse which he is leading, and he is armed for war. Then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam advanced, brandishing his sword and reciting the verse, their forces will be defeated and forced to flee. The presence of the angels was felt by all, but that presence was only visible or audible to a few and in varying degrees. Two men of a neighboring Arab tribe had gone to the top of a hill to watch the battle. A cloud swept by them, a cloud filled with the neighing of stallions, and one of the men dropped instantly dead. His heart burst from fright, said the one who lived to tell of it, judging from what his own heart had felt. One of the believers was pursuing a man of the enemy, and the man's head flew from his body before he could reach him, struck off by an unseen hand. Others had brief glimpses of the angels riding on horses whose hooves never touched the ground, led by Jibreel alayhi salam, who was wearing a yellow turban, whereas the turbans of the other angels were white, with one end left streaming behind them. Although the angels were pursuing the pagans, the battle was still hard fought. Finally, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said to Sayyiduna Ali, hand me some pebbles. He took the pebbles and throwing them at the enemy said, Defaced be their faces. 
O oh Allah, cast terror into their hearts and make their feet stumble. The pebbles entered the eyes of every single pagan as declared by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he said, it was not you, O prophet, who threw when you threw, but it was Allah who threw. The prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then gave them the battle cry, Ya Mansur Amit, you granted victory by Allah, slay them. Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu anhu said, whenever the battle intensified, we would seek refuge with the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. No one was closer to the enemy than he was. The sentiment was captured beautifully by Imam al-Busiri in his blessed poem, Al-Burda. Those whose help comes from the messenger of Allah, even lions encountering them in their dens would be speechless with fear. From that moment on, the pagans began to flee from the field with the Muslims at their heels, killing some and capturing others. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says of this, Indeed, Allah made you victorious at Badr when you were vastly outnumbered. So be mindful of Allah, perhaps you will be grateful. When the battle was over, the Muslims found that they had lost 13 men. Six of the martyrs were migrants and eight were helpers. Of the pagans, 70 were killed and 70 taken captive. The Muslims were buried and the bodies of the pagans were dropped into a pit and covered with sand. The Prophet wasallam then stood over their graves and said, O oh Abu Jahl ibn Hisham, O oh Umayyah ibn Khalaf, O oh Utbah ibn Rabi'ah, O oh Shayba ibn Rabi'ah, did you find your Lord's promise to be true? For I have certainly found what my Lord has promised me to be true. Sayyiduna Umar radiallahu anhu asked, Why are you addressing lifeless bodies? He replied, Sallallahu alayhi wasallam, by the one in whose hand is Muhammad's soul. They hear what I am saying just as well as you do. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his companions returned to Medina as victors and their enemies were vanquished. This decisive victory changed the course of history and was witnessed by and celebrated in the heavenly realm. It has come in narration that Sayyidina Jibreel Alayhi Salam came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and said, What standing do the people of Badr have amongst you? The Prophet ﷺ said, They are the best of the Muslims, or something to that effect. Sayyidina Jibreel ﷺ then said, We hold the angels who attended Badr in the same esteem. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raised their rank in this life and the next and gave them the unparalleled honor of standing alongside his beloved Prophet ﷺ in this pivotal battle. I envy all there at his side who watched the turning of the tide as truth prevailed and falsehood fled and hope restored life to the dead. These are lines by Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. May Allah benefit us by the people of Badr, grant us their love and unite us with them in the highest firdaus in the company of the best of creation. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ameen. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا كريم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي وسدد لساني وهد قلبي بحق سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم it's amazing how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the life of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has given us a blueprint for every situation that we as an ummah will face. That if we study carefully and contemplate the wisdom within the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's life, we will find the solutions that we need for the most complicated problems that we experience today as an ummah. Everything that we need is found in his life and in his guidance, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. And as we as an ummah were experiencing the heart-wrenching 
violence and oppression that's taking place in many places, but we see it on a regular basis in Palestine, in the holy lands of Jerusalem, in Gaza, in the West Bank. We see what's going on with our brothers and sisters in Sudan and in Myanmar and in China and many, many other places. And people who just follow the news and people who want to address these wrongs with these permissible and useful means that are available to us, not to say that these things are, are not helpful, but when we approach these problems, which at the core, the solution lies in realigning ourself and correcting ourself and our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala primarily, and then taking the means available to us without a doubt. But when people look at the means and they sometimes lose sight of the root cause and they lose sight of the most important means of seeking assistance and help, it can become debilitating. I'm hearing this from a lot of people. How can this happen? These people are so genocidal and oppressive and brutal. How can human beings treat each other this way? Why isn't this country doing something about it? Why isn't that country doing something about it? But when we realize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who brings his victory and his assistance, we read that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَقَدْ نَصَرَكُمُ اللَّهُ بِبَدْرٍ وَأَنْتُمْ أَذِلَّةٍ Allah made you victorious at Badr when you were vastly outnumbered. If we look at Badr from that lens of just the outward material means, they shouldn't have won, quote unquote. It wasn't expected that a smaller army that is not well equipped is going to fight against a much larger army that is very well equipped and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them a decisive victory. So be mindful of Allah so that you may be grateful. Remember, O Prophet, when you said to the believers, is it not enough that your Lord will send down a reinforcement of 3,000 angels for your aid? Bala, most certainly. Then what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? And these are things that we have to be mindful of. This is not something that we use as a psychological tool to deal with difficulties. This is something that relates to the very core of our iman and our connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In tasbiru wa tattaqu. If you are patient and steadfast and mindful of Allah, وَيَأْتُوكُمْ مِنْ فَوْرِيَمْ هَذَا يُمْدِدُكُمْ رَبُّكُمْ بِخَمْسَةِ آلَافٍ مِنَ الْمَلَائِكَةِ مُسَوِّمِينَ And the enemy launches a sudden attack on you, Allah will reinforce you with 5,000 angels designated for battle. وَمَا جَعَلَهُ اللَّهُ إِلَّا بُشْرَى لَكُمْ وَلِتَطْمَئِنَّ قُلُوبُكُمْ بِهِ Allah ordained this reinforcement only as good news for you and a reassurance for your heart that the path of patience and the path of mindfulness of Allah is the path of success and victory. And then Allah reminds us, وَمَن نَصْرُ إِلَّا مِنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ And victory comes only from Allah. It manifests in different ways. But we as believers have to have this unwavering certainty in this reality. Al-Aziz Al-Hakim, the Almighty, all wise. And not to take too much time, but if we go and, and look at the verses related to David and Goliath, and looking how this army that once again was outnumbered, was once again fighting against the superior military force. But then the people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they remembered Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can have a small army defeat a large army by Allah's will. Wallahu ma'as sabirin. And Allah is with those who are patient. Allah is with those who are steadfast. And then when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when they faced the army, what did they say? رَبَّنَا أَفْرِغْ عَلَيْنَا صَبْرًا وَثَبِّتْ أَقْدَامَنَا وَانْصُرْنَا عَلَى الْقَوْمِ الْكَافِرِينَ Our Lord, shower us with perseverance. Make our feet firm, unwavering, and give us victory over the disbelieving people. فَهَزَمُوهُمْ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ So they defeated them by Allah's permission. 
That's the result. That's the outcome. But we have to have the qualities and the character traits that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us of these people, the people at Badr, the people who are with Prophet Dawood alayhi salam and so forth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings it back. And Tansurullah Yansurkum, if you give victory to Allah, if you stand up for Allah's religion and cause, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you his assistance and help. So it all comes back to having patience and being mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, turning to him in dua, turning to him completely in need and powerless before him subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that you were vastly outnumbered, wa antum adhillah, Another way that this is understood by the people of Allah is that you were humble. Adilla is another word for saying that you were humble and broken. And when you fought that army, knowing that Allah, that victory only comes from Allah and that there was no arrogance, there was no ulterior motives, that they were completely devoted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then the victory came. So if we want victory from Allah, then we have to be in need before him. If we want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to suffice us, we express our needs only to him. If we want Allah to honor us, then we humble ourselves. Then if we want Allah to give us strength, then we recognize our weakness before him, Jalla Jalalu. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring relief to the ummah and to make this Ramadan and this commemoration of Badr of the most blessed for the in the entire history of the ummah. Ya Arham al-Rahimeen wa Ya Akram al-Akrameen wa sallallahu wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa afdada as-sala wa tammu taslim ala Sayyidina wa Mawlana Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam ajma'in. Subhanaka la ilmana la illa ma'alamtana innaka anta alimul hakim wa la hawla wa la quwata illa billahi al-ali al-azim. Alhamdulillah on this very special day of Ramadan, the 17th of Ramadan, which corresponds not only to the Sayyid al-Shuhur, the very best of all months, this blessed month of Ramadan that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has selected and singled out and bestows His mercy and His divine favor upon His servants in this month like He does in no other months. Yet this is also the day, the commemoration of the blessed battle of Badr, in which that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and the valiant companions who stood by their side fulfilled the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in this moment, and in this battle, and in this time, this is from the days of Allah. And Allah ta'ala says in his book, وَذَكِّرْهُمْ بِأَيَّامِ اللَّهِ And remember and remind them of the days of Allah. The days in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave victory and showed and demonstrated when people live for the right reasons, believe in the right way, the honor that they will attain from their Lord, not only here in this world, but most importantly, when we transition into the next world and in the hereafter. And so there are so, so many lessons that we can learn from this blessed battle that took place that indicate something that you and I need to tap into, which is well within the Adamic potential of every single human being. We don't read these stories merely to hear an account of history. I said, yes, it is a narrative that was recited to us, but we read the narrative of these blessed events and, and incidents that took place so that you and I can connect to them and so that you and I can be inspired by them. And this is why that what is known as the wadha'if and mawasim, the various things that we have to do in line with the Hijri calendar, this is one of the greatest ways in which you and I can expose ourselves to the nefahat, to the sweet breezes of Allah Ta'ala's mercy. And our shiuch emphasize this time and time again. And this is one of the great blessings that there is latitude in our religion to do this because in and of ourselves, when was the last time you and I had read the narrative of the Battle of Badr? Is that we might have only read it once or twice in our whole lives, but on an annual basis, if we read this blessed narrative, and we this was an abridged version, 
is that there are much longer versions that we can read, and I would advise people to at least read on an annual basis the sirah that Martin Ling's put together, which is a beautiful that summary of this blessed battle and the life of our Prophet wasallam. is that you and I are meant to connect to these sacred events that took place in human history, which are the most important events of all. Because these are the events that dictated everything that came after that. This was the Yom al Furqan. This was the decisive day where Allah Ta'ala that gave victory to the believers. And as we read in the narrative, is that were the believers to have been vanquished on that day, you and I would not be sitting here today in Makanji, Pennsylvania, that basking in the light of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. We simply wouldn't be here. You wouldn't find people from all these diverse backgrounds from literally places from all over the world have come together here to talk about these blessed events. This is one of the great signs of Allah is that He gave the believers victory on this blessed day. But then what we have to ask ourselves, what are the meanings behind this victory? What were in the hearts of these blessed individuals such that Allah Taala gave them victory? And this is one of the most important questions of all, because it is to the extent that people after the time of these blessed companions who did their part and were validated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a result, everyone in a subsequent juncture of history, there has to be people who step up to also do their part. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed the legacy of the Prophet to have continuity and it will remain until the very end of time. Our Prophet ﷺ told us, لا تزال طائفة من أمتي ظاهرين على الحق There will always be a group of my ummah that are outwardly manifesting the truth. They will not be harmed by those who work against them until the affair and the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes. There will always be a group of people that stand up and live these same meanings. And this is what we hope is that when we hear these individual accounts of these blessed companions and everything that they were willing to sacrifice because they sat before the best of creation وسلم, and their hearts were filled with iman. They believed with absolute certainty that what our Prophet وسلم, said was true. How could you not? If you would have been in the presence of the Prophet وسلم, and having had witnessed miracles firsthand, they looked at the Prophet him, but they also saw him. And we don't want to be from those who look at him and don't see him. You see that they are looking at you, but they don't see you. We want to look at the Prophet when we can by hearing his description and reading his story, but we also want to see him and to know who he was, وسلم, but even using that in the past tense is a little bit of bad adab. We want to know who he was, we want to know who he is, and we want to know who he will be. And the more that we come to understand that, the greatest manifestation of this will be on the Day of Judgment. When all, there's never been a time where all people live at the same time. Is that the nature of the world is that every roughly hundred years, there's a whole new set of people that are walking on the face of this earth. But on the Day of Judgment, when everyone who's ever lived from the first person, Adam, who was a prophet السلام, until the very last people that the hour comes upon and everyone in between they'll be all gathered. And on that day our Prophet وسلم, will be raised to the maqam al-mahbud the praiseworthy station and everybody will know who Sayyidina Muhammad is on that day وسلم. But the affair for us is to recognize that now, here in this world and of all of the meanings that we can take from Badr, and indeed there are many, the one that we wanted to focus on today, and perhaps one of the most important, is the meaning of remaining loyal to the Prophet Muhammad wasallam. Loyalty is unfortunately a trait that is that not too popular in our time, and it's very difficult to find people that have this trait of loyalty. You're not going to learn this trait 
by going into elementary school or middle school or high school. You're not going to learn this trait by that following too much social media or just watching videos night and day. This is a trait that Allah Ta'ala blessed the Arab with because the vast majority of the companions were Arab. But they used this trait that existed in them naturally for the sake of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala and for the deen. And then to various degrees, there are different degrees to which people naturally have this trait. But if we don't naturally have it, we have to acquire it. And there's ways of acquiring all different types of virtues. But we first must understand what it means to be loyal. This is essentially in relation to allegiance. This is about binding ourselves to the Prophet ﷺ in his way and have a willingness to sacrifice everything because of the depth of our conviction. This is just touching the surface about what this trait really is. But once we come to understand this trait, then it all starts to make sense these blessed things that all of these other companions said, and why they were able to remain so firm, because they were exuding this blessed trait. They had absolute conviction that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, was a prophet of God, and that they were willing to give up everything for that, because they knew the only thing between them and between experiencing what our Prophet وسلم, foretold, prophesied, and told them about, was taking their last breath. And then after that, all of the toil and difficulty of this world is over. And then it's an experience of everlasting bliss and pleasure in the hereafter. The companions that exemplified these great traits and live by them. And I want to hone in on what we heard in the narrative because we have focused in the past on one of the greatest statements in history which is the statement of Sa'd ibn Mu'adh, because we read that. But sometimes the statement of Al-Maqdad ibn Al-Aswad tends to be overlooked because of the grandeur of the statement of Sa'd. But today I want to look in a little bit about this individual and what it is that they said. But to pave the way for this, I want to just translate a few of the verses from Surah Al-Ma'idah, wherein that Allah Taala tells us about some of the people who came before us and the way that they responded in the opposite way. They sold out their prophet. They were disloyal to their prophet. And Allah Ta'ala tells us about them. And so that the same thing won't happen to you and I. And to think, think about today, how many Muslims today have been disloyal to the best of creation, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is precisely why we are in the condition that we are in as an ummah. If we are disloyal and we sell out our Prophet وسلم, for anything that's done the, anything that relates to the things of this world or our desires or anything, what can you possibly expect our situation to be? Is that loyalty to the Prophet وسلم, is a prerequisite for victory? So as Ustad Amjad was saying, is that when we wonder why Muslims are suffering in so many places, we should ask ourselves the question why? And it gets back ultimately to these meanings of loyalty to the Prophet Sallallahu Belief in him and adhering to his way. And when he told us not to do something, we refrain from doing it. And if he told us to do something, we should hasten to do it without any hesitation. This is the way that the companions were. And this is the way that successful people throughout history will always be. So this cluster of verses about the Israelites when they were ordered to enter into the Holy Land. And Allah Ta'ala says in verse 20 of Surah Tan Maid, And remember when Moses said to his people, O oh my people, remember Allah's favors upon you when he raised prophets from among you, made you sovereign, and gave you what he had never given anyone in the world. So again, we should remember the favors of Allah Ta'ala upon us. Ingratitude is one of the main causes for gifts of Allah Ta'ala to be taken from us and for tribulations to be cast upon us. O oh, my people, enter the Holy Land, which Allah has destined for you to enter, and do not turn back or else you will become losers. When a prophet is telling you to do this, you don't think about the means and that think about what's going to happen before you is going to be difficult. You believe in what they say and you move forward. But they replied, O oh, Moses, 
there is an enormously powerful people there. So we will never be able to enter until they leave. If they do, then we will enter. Their loyalty was conditional. That they looked outwardly and saw the affair and end, that made an assessment based upon their own limited intellect, not realizing that Allah Ta'ala has the power to give anyone victory over anyone else. But then, that when this was said, there was two of the believers that stood by Sayyidina Musa, and one of them was Sayyidina Yusha, who we mentioned last night in the story of that when Allah in Surah Al-Kahf, two God-fearing men stepped forward. Rajulani min alinya khafun. That the two men that have fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they stood up and they had been blessed by Allah and they said, surprise them through the gate. If you do, you will certainly prevail. Put your trust in Allah if you are truly believers. Yet they said, and this is the vast majority of them, O oh Moses, still we will never enter as long as they remain there. So go, both you and your Lord, and fight. We are staying right here. We are the billah. So go, both you and your Lord, and fight. We are staying right here. Now, unfortunately, there are. There's a way that we act sometimes, and certain individuals within the Ummah of our Prophet and act sometimes even though they might not say these words, but in relation to their commitment to this deen and what it is that we're supposed to do, it's as if that they're saying it. And this is not what we want to be like. And this is why in Miqdad ibn Aswad radiallahu anhu, he said what he said, because he realized there was people who came before us who did not show loyalty to the prophets of their time. And then looked what happened. And this is why that these people were exiled for their lands and they were forced to wander for 40 years. And so there are consequences when we don't adhere to the prophetic teachings. Now from the standpoint of reality, it's still a mercy. So that it happens here in this world and not in the hereafter. So in Miqdad, what did he say on the Bay of Badr? after Sayyidina Abu Bakr and Sayyidina Umar both spoke, and they both spoke well, is that he had a very different response when the Prophet was sought their, 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 their counsel to see whether or not they should head back and they should go for the caravan or to remain. And then the Prophet وسلم, after seeking their counsel, that Iqmaqdad stands up and he says, Ya Rasulullah, O Messenger of Allah, we are not going to say to you what Bani Israel said to Moses, we're not going to say to you what they said to them. We're not going to say that. Rather, is that go forward. And we are with you. And this is in Bukhari, and the other narration is the one that we translated. And that go forward, and that we are going to fight on your right side, and on your left side, and before you, and behind you. And even though you and I were not there to fight during the Battle of Badr, you and I still have a battleground of life that we face on every single day, face every single day of our lives. And even though these meanings of jihad, i.e., physical combat, was for these blessed individuals who were singled out for it, for you and I, is that we bring these meanings into our lives and to work on ourselves, putting the prophetic teachings into practice and to do our very best to spread them amongst creation and rectify and uplift people and bring the truth with to them worldwide. This is our job in our time. And this is the way that we can be inspired by these meanings and then do what they did in their time in the context of our time. And that then one of the narrations of Bukhari is that it's narrated by that Ibn Mas'ud and he describes the situation about in Miqdad ibn Aswad and how that this whatever this what when this took place he said and he said what he said he says that I wish I could have given everything in the world to have been the one who said this same statement to have been the one who's going to go down in history to be able to articulate this meaning 
He says, I wish I could give everything in the world to have been this person. But then if we pause here and we look at who al miqdad was, you start to understand who these companions were when you start to understand that where it is that they came from and where they learned these meanings. Is that Maghdad had been with the Prophet ﷺ from the beginning. His name is Maghdad ibn Amr bin ibn Tha'laba al-Kindi. And he just became known as Ibn al-Aswad because that he was that uh, taken in by one of the tribes of the of the of one of the Meccan tribes. And that he became Muslim in the very earliest of stages. And the Prophet ﷺ married him to his first cousin. And there's a story where he was sitting with one of the companions, and this compa and he, his companion said to him, Why don't you get married? And he said, Well, marry me to your daughter. And the companion was offended and spoke to him in a difficult and that said words that were that, that had bothered Mick. So Mikdad goes to the Prophet ﷺ and says, and mentioned to him what had happened. And the Prophet says, I'll get you married. And the Prophet ﷺ married him to his first cousin, the granddaughter of Abdul Muttalib. This is the way that he was, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, the one who said this about this statement in Badr, as he said that Miqdad was one of the seven that were the first to openly be Muslim in the hostile environment of Mecca. So there's different narrations, but we know there was a few individuals that Allah Taala gave the courage to openly be Muslim in the hostile environment of Mecca. And this narration is from Al-Hakim in the Mustadrak, is where it says the first seven people to openly manifest their Islam were the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, of course, Abu Bakr as Siddiq. Who else would you expect to be the, that second person after the Prophet Sallallahu And then Ammar. Ammar ibn Yasser and his blessed mother, Sumayya, the third and the fourth. And then Suhaib, Rumi, was number five. And then Bilal was number six. And al miqdad was number seven. And then the narration goes on, is that Allah Taala look at the adab of these narrators. Allah protected the Prophet Sallallahu through yani, the means of his uncle, Abu Talib. And that Abu Bakr was protected by his people. He said, as for the others, is that they were forced to wear coat mail of iron and they were placed out in the hot sun of the Arabian Peninsula and tortured over and over again. But these were people who, despite that, it didn't, they did not shy away from professing their faith openly. Think about how many Muslims hide their faith or embarrassed by their faith. What do we have to be embarrassed about? We have what everybody in this world needs. It's to say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. We do not want to be people. We should never be people who are embarrassed by our faith. Is that our pride is that we are an abd of Allah. We don't have pride in the normal sense of the word pride. Our pride is that we are a servant of Allah. That's what we are proud about. We see ourselves as nothing but that based upon this internal strength where we recognize is that the greatest gift of all is the gift of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. No matter where you are from on the face of this earth, no matter what your that social status is, whatever relates to you, the color of your skin, of all of these different things that create social distinctions, if Allah gave you La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, He gave you the greatest possible blessing and distinction that anyone could ever be given. But he grew up with the Prophet Sallallahu from the earliest time in Mecca and he was a person of courage. And he was a person that was down for the Prophet Sallallahu committed to his cause, dedicated to him, that his heart and his mind and everything was bound totally to the Prophet Sallallahu that gave him this loyalty. So then, that it makes sense in the Battle of Badr 
when they're about to attain, they're about, they have imminent danger at hand that he's going to say these blessed statements because these meanings were cultivated in him from the very beginning. Mm. And this is why that in a blessed hadith and the collection of Ramatanmadi, look what the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, about these four special individuals. Inna Allah amarani. Allah has commanded me bi hubbi arba'a to love four people. وَأَخْبَرَنِي أَنَّهُ يُحِبُّهُمْ And Allah informed me that He, subhanahu wa ta'ala, loves them. قِيلَ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ سَمِّهِمْ لَنَا O Messenger of Allah, name them for us. They want to know them, of course. Why? Because they want to know them so they can love them as well. Because they know if they share in that love is that the blessings will be showered upon them as well. And then the Prophet said, عَلِيٌ مِنْ هُمْ Ali is from them. And you repeat it three times. Ali is from them. Ali is from them. The first one you mentioned is Sayyidina Ali bin Abi Talib. And then he said, Wa Abu Dhar, the great companion Abu Dhar al Ghifari. And then, Wal Miqdad, who we're talking about here. Wa Salman, Amarani bi hubbihim. Allah Ta'ala commanded me to love them. Wa akhbarani annahu yuhibbuhum. And he informed me that he loves them. But when you live this way and think about what Miqdad said, and everything that happened in the hearts of those that were standing that with the Prophet sent him, and what they were then able to do, and how important that it is for Islamic and that world history in its entirety. And think about the station that he's going to have on Yom Qiyamah. And ultimately, once you become beloved to Allah and the Messenger of Allah, you are unable to ever fully articulate what that means. The tongue is unable to fully express what it means to become beloved to Allah and the Messenger of Allah. And this is extended to us in our time. Don't think that this is something just for 1400 plus years ago. This is extended to us in our time to become people through their loyalty to our Prophet Sallallahu and the teachings that he brought and striving to learn them, put them into practice, and then spend our lives and exhaust every waking moment in spreading his blessed deen and disseminating his sunnah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there's an opportunity for us. In a time where so many people have turned away from religion altogether, and so many people are critical of that true belief to attain high degrees of closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which will come through that sacrifice, which would resemble the sacrifice of the people of Badr. May Allah Taala God give us tawfiq and bless our feet to be firm and to be people who are loyal to the Prophet Sallallahu and all of the meanings that were described and many more that we didn't speak about and to love these companions and to be raised with them. And inshallah Ta'ala live in a way such that when we die and we transfer from this world into the next world, we transition from this world into the next world as that they are there waiting for us. And that they want to also be with us just as we want to be with them eternally in the highest levels of paradise. Ya Arham Rahimin wa sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad and wa ala alayhi wa sallam 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 We can all uh, download the packets from albaqasa.org if you don't have the packet yet. Backslash Badr. And um, there's a few invocations that we will end with, inshallah ta'ala. يا حي يا قيوم لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين يا حي يا قيوم لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين يا حي يا قيوم لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين يا حي يا قيوم لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين يا حي يا قيوم لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين يا حي يا قيوم لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين يا حي يا قيوم لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين يا حي يا قيوم لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين يا حي يا قيوم لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين يا حي يا قيوم لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين يا 
حي يا قيوم لا اله الا انت سبحانك اني كنت من الظالمين يا حي يا قيوم لا اله الا يا حي يا قيوم وهب لنا الخير العظيم يا حي يا قيوم وافتح لنا الفتح المبين يا حي يا قيوم وانصر جيوش المؤمنين يا حي يا قيوم واخذل جميع الكافرين يا حي يا قيوم مسلم شؤون المسلمين يا حي يا قيوم وانصر يا رب القلوب يا حي يا قيوم ونقيها عن كل يا حي يا قيوم واغفر لنا كل الذنوب يا حي يا قيوم واستر لنا كل العيوب يا حي يا قيوم واكشف إلهي للكروب يا حي يا قيوم وافتح لنا باب القبول يا حي يا قيوم وامن إلهي بالوصول يا حي يا قيوم أبنى المنى مع كل سول يا حي يا قيوم أمن علي روح الرسول يا حي يا قيوم سيدنا ابا البطول يا حي يا قيوم خير الورى ضحى الوصول يا حي يا قيوم زكي لنا به العقول يا حي يا قيوم بجاه والد فاطمه يا حي يا قيوم امن بحسن الخاتمه يا حي يا قيوم بجاه والد فاطمه يا حي يا قيوم أمن بحسن الخاتمة يا حي يا قيوم بجاه والد فاطمة يا حي يا قيوم أمن بحسن الخاتمة صلاة الله سلام الله على طه رسول الله صلاة الله سلام الله على 
Yasin Habibi La Salatullah Salamullah Ala Taha Rasulillah Ala Salatullah Salamullah Ala Yasin Habibi La Tawassalna Bi Bismillah Wa Bil Hadi Rasulillah Bye. 
Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. All praise be to Allah who originated all things and brought them into existence, who created and fashioned all things, who decreed and ordained all things, who arranged and ordered all things, who chose to bring forward certain things and to date Allah others, who chose to hide certain things and to manifest others, who chose to reveal certain things and conceal others, who chose to unveil certain things and veil others, who purifies and cleanses whoever he wishes, who chooses and selects whoever he wishes, who clarifies and enlightens, who guides and facilitates, who forbids and commands, who encourages certain things and cautions against others, who warned and gave good tidings on the tongue of his beloved, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, the pure one, the chosen one from the tribe of Madar. He is the one who singled out the most splendid month Ramadan, the illuminated, and singled out the 17th night for a vast portion of his bounty. The following day he made manifest his absolute victory and bestowed his complete support upon his beloved, whose character is most sweet, our master Muhammad, the one whose face shines. May Allah's prayers, peace, and blessings be upon him, his family, the pure people of his household, and his noble companions, the immigrants and the helpers, especially those who are present at Badr, and those that follow them upon the straight of the past until the day of gathering. We bear witness that there is no deity save Allah alone. He is no partners. Allah is most great. We bear witness that our master Muhammad, the most pure, is his slave and messenger. O Allah, bestow prayers, peace, blessings, and honor upon him, O living, O self-existing, O beneficent, and pure, upon his pure family and great companions. Prayers as numerous as all things manifest in concealed prayers, which purify and cleanse the heart and guide it and illuminate it. Prayers through which the ummah is rectified, evil is deflected, all impurities are removed, the banner of truth is raised, and the oppressors and disbelievers are crushed to proceed. O people of faith, most of the days and nights of the month of Ramadan, the month of mercy and forgiveness of salvation from the fire, have passed by in succession. They have passed by, and each of you is in a different state, a different degree of progress and readiness. Now the eve of the day of discrimination has approached, the day on which the two forces met. It is an event which brings good tidings to everyone who is truthful and honors the covenant of his Lord, and is a reminder and a warning to everyone who is heedless and fails to honor the covenant. <clears throat> so reflect deeply upon these meanings. For the two forces represent the two groups on the last day. A group will be in paradise and a group will be in the inferno. The Quran expressed this when it mentioned these two opponents. What difference is there between the two groups other than aims and objectives, beliefs and intentions, character traits and qualities? What difference is there between them other than belief and disbelief, filth and purity? These are the things that lead to victory or loss, entry into paradise or the fire and the pleasure or wrath of the compeller. O believe, scrutinize your, O believer, scrutinize your aims and your objectives, your beliefs and intentions, your character traits and qualities. Ask yourself to which of the two groups you are closest and to which of them you belong. If you do not correct your aims and objectives, strengthen your beliefs and rectify your intentions and refine your character and attributes in these glorious days and magnificent nights, when will you do so? When will you join the people of success? When will you leave behind your wrongdoings and wipe your slate clean? Do you have the strength and audacity to meet Allah, the one with the one unforgiven sin? So how about the numerous sins which have blackened your book? In what state will you be when you meet him? How will you respond when he asks you? Have you not heard the statement of the one who Allah chose and sent? Woe to the one who reaches Ramadan and is not forgiven. So let this night be a night of reconciliation with your Lord, the one whose knowledge encompasses everything you reveal and conceal. 
Perhaps he will turn to you and gaze upon you with the eye of his mercy. Perhaps he will be generous to you and be content with you. On the day of the meeting, perhaps he will show immense kindness to you. Prepare yourself to receive a gaze like the gaze of the people of Bedr. Receive from the Lord of all people on this magnificent night. Prepare yourself with a true resolve and intention to purify your heart, to earnestly act upon Allah's commands, to follow the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah, his chosen one, to sacrifice your soul and everything you possess for the sake of La ilaha illallah and for the people of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Prepare yourself to receive a gaze like the gaze that people better receive from the Lord of all people on this magnificent night. Prepare yourself with a true resolve and intention to purify your heart, to earnestly act upon Allah's commands, to follow the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah, His chosen one, to sacrifice your soul and everything you possess for the sake of La ilaha illallah and for the people of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. O oh Allah, O oh living, O oh self-existing, gaze upon us. O oh Allah, O oh living, O oh self-existing, O oh most compassionate, O oh most merciful, gaze upon us. O oh Allah, O oh living, O oh self-existing, O oh most generous, gaze upon us. O oh Allah, O oh living, O oh self-existing, O oh most high, O oh most great, gaze upon us. O oh Allah, O oh living, O oh self-existing, O oh limitless one, O oh flawless one, gaze upon us. O oh Allah, O oh living, O oh self-existing, O oh Lord of majesty and generosity, gaze upon us. Gaze upon our mothers and fathers, our progeny and our relatives, those who have rights over us and those that we love. Gaze upon us as you gazed upon our masters, the noble people of Badr, by your merciful, by your mercy, O most merciful. Allow us to be with them when we when we are resurrected. Bless us to be in their company and the party of your slave, the chosen one, your prophet, the one you selected, your intercessor, the one who has sought your beloved, the one who you singled out, the master of people of the heavens and the earth. O Allah, O living, O self self existing, you we turn to you on this night and this gathering of ours for the sake of our Ummah, of your beloved, the chosen one, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know best what their state is and what has befallen them. So, O oh, Ya Hayyu Ya Qayyum, relieve their suffering and rectify their hearts. Ya Hayyu Ya Qayyum, right, and unite them on the path of guidance, bring harmony between them. Ya Hayyu Ya Qayyum, remove the hardships that have befallen them. Transform their states, raise the banner of your beloved Master Muhammad among them and give them the ability to support his cause. To, to support his cause. O oh, Allah, heal the sick among them. Bless those who are suffering with well-being. Free the captives among you and defeat their enemies. Ya Hayyu Ya Qayyum, we ask you for a quick relief, swift support, a mighty victory, and a clear opening. Ya Hayyu Ya Qayyum, forgive us of our past and future sins. Complete your blessings upon us and guide us to the straight path. O oh Allah, do not send us forth from this gathering unless you have accepted us and blessed us with your pardon, with well-being, with your subtle gifts, and with protection from all harm and evil in both abodes. And bestow it upon us the good of this life, the barzakh, and the next life. We ask you for the, for this by the blessings and status of your slave and chosen and beloved, the chosen one, the trustworthy one, the chosen one, Sayyidina Muhammad, the master of the messengers by the noble people of cloak, Sayyidina Ali bin Abi Talib, Sayyidina Fatim al Zahra, Sayyidina Hassan wa Sayyidina Hussein, and all his sons and daughters and his progeny and the pure people of his household, by Sayyidina Khadija Kubra, wa Sayyidina Aisha Tarada, and all of the mothers of the viewers, the rightly guided caterers, the people of Badr Uhud, and those who pledge their allegiance at Al Aqaba, and those who attain Allah's pleasure by pledging their allegiance at Hudaybiyah, and all the noble companions and those who are in the presence from among the prophets and messengers, the angels who have been drawn near, and all of Allah's pious slaves. May Allah's prayers and peace be upon him and upon them all, and upon us along with them by your mercy, O most merciful. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma isifun, wa salam ala adam mursaneen, wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Nashadu wa la Astaghfirullah, nasaluka al-jannata wa na'udhu bika min al-nar.